Well, good evening and good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are, folks. It is so good to be joining you again in another video. Let me say right at the outset, I've got to fill you in on Amanda and I've got to fill you in on Gemma very quickly. Please continue to pray for these two young mothers. As you know, Amanda will be getting results. They will be posted on our Facebook page or on Hope to Families. We'll, we'll do that and we'll get that information out to you. And with regards to Gemma, please remember Gemma, she will be traveling to Mexico very soon. We're absolutely overwhelmed. It's the second day of her GoFundMe. Already lifted 137,000 pounds. And that is amazing since Gemma posted that. It's amazing what you're doing. And I know that Gemma and her dear husband Clive and the family are so appreciative of that. So thank you so much. Tonight, oh, I'm so thrilled. And, and I want to introduce this wonderful person. You've probably seen her already sitting patiently waiting on Mark to stop talking. Chantelle, it's so good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Chantelle, honestly, it's so good. I know the past few weeks, Chantelle, have been so difficult for you. Um, the folk that are watching, the majority of them will not know that you lost your dear cousin, who you were so close to and so fond of. So we are with you in that, Chantelle. We're praying for you in that. And we thank you just for taking the time out to share your journey. So I'm going to just stop talking, Chantelle. You're going to just share your journey, what God has done and is doing in your life, just as the Holy Spirit leads you. So thank you, Chantelle, so, so much. Thank you, Mark. God bless you. I just want to say um, I'm just really grateful that you've asked me to share. I love sharing about what the Lord has done because I know how far he has brought me. I always say when I share my story that the Lord reached into the deepest, darkest part of the pit and he pulled me out and he put my feet on solid ground and he's given me a purpose and he's given me a reason to live. And because of that, I just want to share what he's done in my life. I want to share how far he's brought me just so that others can know that it doesn't matter, Mark, where you start. It doesn't matter what your journey was like before. It doesn't matter how far you've slipped away from God. When you surrender all to the Lord, he will just bless your life and restore you, transform you, just make changes in your life. You know, and that's exactly what he done for me. And so I'm going to go right back to the beginning because that's where a lot of my issues started. So I was born into, born into a single parent household. So my dad kind of was around, but he wasn't around often. So I would speak to him occasionally. He lived in a different city at this time. And, um, you know, I didn't see him often. And so from a very early age, I remember just feeling just the, the strong feelings of rejection and just feeling like, why is it that my dad doesn't want to be around? Why isn't it that my dad is not in my life every day like he should be? And I found it really difficult, to be honest. And, you know, I know it wasn't my fault now, but during this time, I felt like it was my fault that my dad wasn't around. And so when my mum met my stepdad, and my sister was born when I was about four, I still struggled with why do I not have my dad? And now my sister's dad, he was amazing. Like to me, he always included me. He always made sure I was a part of the family. He'd never made me feel like I wasn't a part of the family, but I still longed for my own dad desperately. And it was that bad that even like being in primary school, I would be getting in trouble. I remember getting suspended at the age of like eight because I had a fight with a girl because I was really jealous of her because she had her dad and I didn't. And so because I didn't know how to express what I was feeling inside, that's how it came out. I was, you know, getting into trouble all the time. I was attention seeking. My mum had to always go to the school because I was always getting in trouble because I just craved attention, Mark. I craved some form of attention this longing I just wanted to feel like I was important in some aspect so even if it was getting into trouble for me I was getting attention and then I remember the day that my mum and my stepdad announced to us that they were um splitting up and I thought to myself you know that's so difficult because I don't know if you've ever seen the really old film mark Jurassic Park <laughs> the first one ever with like the dinosaurs now if you watch it now they look plastic but at this point, 
I remember just when I was younger um, I used to I was really scared of that film and I remember I used to feel like this is what I used to say to myself if dinosaurs were ever to come back on this earth I know that my stepdad would save me because to me he was my hero I looked to him as a hero and it's also important to say that I didn't know the Lord at this point I didn't grow up in a Christian household now I used to go to Sunday school every so often um but I didn't relate to being in church I didn't understand church and I didn't feel like anyone understood me and so I didn't realize that going to church is not just about singing songs and you know reading a few scriptures going to church being a Christian is about having a relationship with Jesus and so I didn't feel like I was relatable in church I didn't feel like I related to anybody so I didn't like to go so back to where my like mum my and my stepdad broke up I was devastated I was so hurt because we weren't going to see him every single day anymore and so I lived for the weekends to see my stepdad every single weekend he would come and see us he would take us out he would take us to McDonald's he'd get us some happy meal and I really lived for those moments because I didn't have my own dad and so this was like the best I could get you know as a father to me and so I remember the day that he came to us and he said to us he put my sister and I in his car and he said to us you know I'm moving away to Canada for a year girls and it's only for a year to do with work but don't worry I'm going to call you both every single day and then in a year's time I'm coming back so you haven't got to worry and then again it was like my heart was ripped out again I was like oh so it's not going to be every weekend anymore it's going to be a whole year but do you know what I'm looking forward to our daily conversations on the phone and then when my um, stepdad moved away to Canada he didn't call us for four years and I really really struggled like I didn't understand why another dad has now rejected me I couldn't cope with like the feeling of why do men not stay in my life? What is it that I've done that's made these men leave? And I used to really believe that I was the reason that my dad left, my stepdad's left. You know, I used to, I remember I was crying to my mum, I was about 12 and I, used to, I was crying to my mum and I said, mum, why doesn't he want to know us? Like, why doesn't he want to see us? Why hasn't he called us? And my mum didn't even know what to say, but I could not understand or comprehend the fact that my stepdad hasn't called me. Four years it took for him to call. During this time, I just then decided at the age of 14 that I need a man in my life. I need a male voice. So then at the age of 14, I then got into this very vicious lifestyle of vicious cycle of I'm going to give myself to guys. So then at the age of 14, I then became very promiscuous. And it wasn't that I was this girl that just wanted to be like this. I was searching for something. I had this void in my heart and I wanted to fill it with this love. And I felt that even if I'm giving my body to a, a guy, even if it's just for one night, I feel like I'm worth something for what one night. So that was the cycle I got myself into where I, I, was, I felt like I was worth something. Even if the next day they weren't interested, they didn't want to know me, they didn't call me again. For me, I felt like I was worth something for that one night. And it, it became like, um, like a drug, like I needed that attention. So then I just got into that cycle of just giving myself to anybody that would have me. And it gave me a very bad reputation because don't forget, I'm only like 14, 15, and this is the lifestyle that I'm living. But I know that even now when I speak to many young women, there's a lot of fatherless young girls. There's a lot of fatherless young girls that are searching for that male voice and they're living this promiscuous life because they're getting attention from guys because they don't have the attention from their fathers. And that was me. And like I said, I didn't know the Lord. But even through this, I now know that, that God always knew me. And it's just emotional when I think about the fact that even through this lifestyle, even through the things that I was doing, God was with me and he had his hand upon my life. And I remember at the age of 16, Mark, this is just a miraculous story of what God did and how he showed that he was with me. And so at the age of 16, I was doing my exams and um, 
I remember I was walking home from school with my best friend and my best friend out of the blue just said to me, you know, I really like your coat. Should we swap coats? And I had this like, like little thin black jacket on and she had this really trendy denim jacket on. And so I said, of course, like, I love your coat. You, you wear mine, I'll wear yours as you do at 16. And so we swapped coats and about half an hour later, I just remember um, another walking past another friend's house who I thought was my friend. And this girl came out of her house and she started arguing with me for no reason. I can't even remember what the argument was about. It was really something really silly. And then she attacked me. And when she attacked me, her sister attacked me and another girl. And so my best friend was there trying to get these girls off me. I'm trying to defend myself thinking what's going on. The girl that came out of her house went back in her house and she came out and whilst my back was turned, she came out with this, you know, the knives that you use to like cut a loaf of bread, like the really thick, like long ones. She came out with this knife and she stabbed me in my back. And where she stabbed me was literally just behind my heart, like on my left side, just behind my heart. And I remember um, just turning around and just seeing her standing there with a knife in her hand and my blood just dripping off this knife. And I remember it was all like a big rush, like ambulance were called. I was taken to the hospital. And I remember the words that the doctor said to me. The doctor said, Chantal, these are exact words. He said, you're very lucky. He said, the coat that you was wearing saved your life. Wow. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, because of the thickness of the denim jacket, the knife couldn't go in deep enough to penetrate your heart because if it penetrated my heart I literally probably would have died there on the spot and so I know now that that coat was like a covering that God put his hand upon my life at that moment and he covered me Mark mm -hmm. he covered me because he knew that he was going to call me for such a time as this he could see where I was going to be he didn't look at where I was at that point he looked at where I was going to be in the future and what he was going to do with my life. And I can honestly say I am so grateful that the Lord did not allow me to die on that night with, in my sin. He did not allow me to die separated from him. He kept me for a reason. But even at this time, I was still unaware that, wow, this is Jesus. I believe that I was being watched over. I was like, wow, somebody's watching over me but I still didn't believe it was Jesus. Like I didn't know. And so after being stabbed, I was still, you know, going through this lifestyle of just giving myself to guys. I was suffering with anxiety. I was having panic attacks on a daily basis. I ended up in hospital a few times with like, we're bringing my blood pressure up because I was having panic attacks regularly. Um, and I just remember sitting there one day thinking to myself, if I'm alive in 10 years time, which I don't think I'm going to be, I have to write a book about my life because I don't believe that I can be going through all of this stuff for it to not mean something. But I didn't think I was going to be alive in 10 years time because I didn't have any hope for a future. Looking forward to the future just looked bleak to me. You know, I used to look at pictures of myself of when I was a young child and I used to cry because I felt like I'd let that little girl down. And I, so I remember looking at them and thinking, I've let you down. And this was the lifestyle or the mindset that I had. I had no self-worth. I had no, you know, I didn't appreciate who I was. I was insecure. I allowed guys to treat me like rubbish. But I didn't know how to get out of this cycle. I remember at the age of 17, I met my daughter's dad. And the first time that we actually, you know, got together, I got pregnant with my daughter and I was desperate to keep my baby. I was like, I'm going to keep my baby. I was only 17. Um, he wasn't happy about this because he'd heard so much about me, you know, guys talk and, you know, I had this bad reputation and that's not the kind of girl he wanted to have his baby. But I was adamant I was going to keep my baby because I wanted someone that I was going to love and that would love me back. And um, the relationship wasn't the best. You know, it was very abusive. It was emotionally abusive physically. But it's because he was also a fatherless 
man. And so we had two very toxic people trying to be in this relationship with a baby. It was just never going to work. And I didn't have any idea of what a healthy relationship was. I'd never seen in my lifestyle or in my family what a healthy relationship was. My mum's one of seven women, seven sisters. Um, and not one of my aunties or my mum have ever been married. So for me, I've never seen anything that was a healthy relationship. My grandparents on both sides of divorce. So I didn't know what a healthy relationship was. So even though it was physically abusive, I just thought that was normal. I thought that was love. That's all I knew what love was. But at the age of um, about a year later, after having my daughter, my daughter's dad went to jail um, just for some unrelated, you know, some other offence. And then out there I was at the age of 18, 19, with a baby, a single mum, you know, with a little girl. And I just felt like, oh, what is, what, what now? So I got back into that lifestyle again of, this promiscuous living, give myself that to anyone that would have me because I was desperate for this love. And, you know, it was just really bad time in my life. And I remember meeting this girl one day and um, she said to me, you know, you've got a baby, you've not got any money, you're going to college once a week, you know, why don't you get into lap dancing? And so I thought, wow, that's a win-win situation. I can make money and I'll be getting like attention from men, you know, that's what I crave. And so at the age of 19, I then became a lap dancer for four years. And it was horrible. It was not what I expected. You know, on the TV, you see all these lap dancing clubs and it looks glamorous and the women look confident. But I can honestly say that nearly every single woman that was in that building was insecure, just like me. A lot of them were taking a lot of drugs to get through the night. Um, a lot of them were getting into prostitution. I, was a, I would drink, so I was scared of drugs, but I would drink, so I would drink a whole bottle of wine to myself before I'd start work. I would walk around like I'm this confident woman. I'd be making lots of money, pretending and oozing all this confidence, and then I'd go home and I'd cry myself to sleep because the thing that I thought would fill the void still didn't fill this void that I had in my heart. I was still empty. I was getting all this attention from men. I was making all this money, and yet, I was empty and I was broken. But for four years, I stayed there because I felt like if I leave this place, what else have I got going for me? What else is there in my life? What else, you know, I'm not good at anything. Well, I didn't think I was anyway. Um, you know, nobody wants me. I'm just going to stay in this place. So I stayed there for four years. But God is amazing. You know, there is a happy ending to this story. It's not all just doom and gloom. God is so amazing. Now, the final year of me dancing, I remember I came home one night, I put the TV on, and there on Sky, on Sky TV, on the radio station, there was a station called UCB Inspirational. So it's United Christian Broadcasters International. I know there's a UCB in Ireland as well, and there's a UCB in England. And I remember sitting there hearing about these words about this man called Jesus and how he's a father to the fatherless. And I remember crying and thinking, who is this man? Who is this God? I want to know who this father is. I haven't got a father. I want to know Jesus. And so for a whole year, it will sound so strange now when I say this, but for a whole year, I would go to the lap dancing club. I would work on the weekends and I'd go home and I'd put UCB on and listen to these songs, worship about Jesus. And I just want to add, this is very important for me to add, and I, I always add this when I'm sharing. If you are praying for somebody, or if anybody is praying for someone where it looks like all hope is lost, it looks like their life is not changing, it looks like they're still taking drugs, they're still sleeping around, they're still, you know, drinking loads of alcohol, don't stop praying because my mom my dad's mom my nan she's a prayer warrior and I know she always prayed for me even when I didn't want her to and I can honestly say in that whole year of going to the lap dancing club and then listening to UCB the Lord was doing an inward work in my heart that nobody else could see so God's doing this work but on the outside I'm still meeting up with guys I'm still lap dancing 
I'm still drinking. So on the outside, it looks like my nan's prayers are not being answered. But on the inside, God was doing a work because I started to then go off lap dancing. And there'd be times where I had no money and I wouldn't go because I just didn't want to and I didn't know why. But I know the Holy Spirit had begun his work in my heart. And then on the 29th of March in 2008, I went to lap dancing club as normal. I was working. It got to like the early hours of Sunday morning. And I remember having this overwhelming desire. I want to go to church tomorrow. Don't know where it came from. Obviously, the Holy Spirit. But I was like, I have to go to church. No one had said to me, Chantal, you have to go to church. No one had. I just had this desire that tomorrow I have to go to church. And I remember walking up to the boss of the club and I said to him, I said, these are my exact words. I said, I need to leave early. And he said to me, why do you need to leave early, Chantal? Well, I used a fake name, that dancing name. He said, why do you need to leave early? You know, you're making a lot of money. And I said, this is going to sound strange. This is what I said to him. I don't know. I just need to go to church tomorrow. So I'm standing there, head to toe, in lap dancing gear, telling this guy that I need to go to church tomorrow. <laughs> and he started to laugh and he looked me up and down. And he said, you go to church. If you walked into church, you would set on fire. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care. I just have to go. And he said, fine, you can go. But do you know what? I believe that what he said that moment was a prophetic word over my life. Because I am on fire for Jesus. Amen. You know, I'm so on fire for God. So he spoke over my life and not even realized what he said. But I am on fire. Literally, like, not literally, but I am spiritually on fire. So he was speaking the truth. But I said to him, I don't care. I need to go. He said, you can go. So I left the, the club at like four in the morning or five or something. And I remember running home and I remember messaging my mom's friend because I knew she had... um. I knew she went to church and I said, can I come to church with you in the morning? And she texted me back straight away. She was like, of course we can. It starts in a couple of hours. Just meet me there. And so I went to church this day. It was amazing. I was sat in the back and I remember hearing the words again, that the Lord is a father to the fatherless. You know, he died so that we could live. You know, if we just give our lives, he came for us. He came to die for us. And I remember sitting there thinking, I was just crying in the back of the church. I was sitting there just crying because the words really ministered to me. And I remember at the end, there was an altar call for anyone that wanted to give their lives to Jesus, surrender. And I don't physically remember going, yes, I want to. I just remember my arm was in the air. And so they called me forward and was like, come forward for prayer. And as I walked forward, I was aware that even in this big service, I was the only person that went forward for prayer. And I do believe, Mark, at that moment, I was that lost sheep. I was the one where God had left the 99 and he was there that day for me. And I went forward and they said to me, do you believe that Jesus died? I said, yes. I said, do you believe that he rose again on the third day? I said, yes. I said, do you want to accept him into your heart? I said, I do. And they said, well, you know, repeat this prayer after me. And so as I opened my mouth, I started to sob, like this release just came. And it's, it weren't like a pretty cry where a little tear comes down. It was like snot everywhere, sobbing. So I, was <laughs> I was a mess. Yeah. I can honestly say at that moment, I this is not cliche when I say this. This is the truth. I physically, like physically felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I felt like this big light like, thing just go off. I felt it. I physically felt it. And I know, Mark, that at that moment, every pain, every feeling of worthlessness, every rejection, every suicidal thought, every feeling of I'm not wanted, low self-esteem, every single one of those feelings, God took it off me at that moment. He took it off me at that moment. And that was the, lot, the day that I gave my life to the Lord. That was the 30th of March, 2008. And I never, ever went back to the lap dancing club. Amen. So let's hope that minister to the boss, because he probably thought to himself, she left for church and never came back. That's right, that's right. Now, I was this girl that was there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So for him not to ever see me again, I pray that really ministered to him. Who knows? But it's just been a journey, Mark. Like, since I got saved, 
my life has completely changed. But not only has my life changed, I've changed. Like the Lord had to do an inward work in me and it wasn't overnight. There was a lot of things that I had to loose and let go of. There was a lot of feelings about myself. When I first got saved, I remember writing a poem to God called Who Am I? Because I didn't know who I was. All I knew was who everybody wanted Chantel to be. But I didn't know who Chantel was. I didn't even know what my favourite colour was. I didn't know anything about myself. And I remember writing a, a, a poem to the Lord just saying, who am I? And, um, you know, all the, the ways and my, my ways and the thoughts and all those mindsets, it, was a, it took a lot of chiseling away, which was hard because I was so used to living in these, this prison in my mind that it was hard to feel or allow myself to be free from those thoughts, like to trust somebody. I struggled with that because I was so used to not trusting because I'd built up that, that wall in my brain that I can't trust any man because men leave. And so for God to work on that, it took a lot of trust in the Lord. You know, he did so much. My dad and I, my, uh, my, my biological dad and I are like best friends. God restored our relationship completely. You know, I'm going to um, COVID permitting. I'm going to New York and Miami this year. My dad lives in New York. Um, he's, you know, we go there all the time or before COVID. You know, I'm really close to my dad because that's what God did. He restored all the years that the locusts had eaten. Everything that the enemy had taken from me, God has given me back double fold. You know, I'm now a married woman. Amen. I, I can't believe that. I was like, somebody actually wanted me, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it <laughs> even the way I met my husband that's a story in itself like that is a whole testimony um but and even like just being with my husband and deciding that I want to save myself till marriage I was a girl that would just give myself to guys in the past but like I said the Lord started to do a work where he started showing me my worth and that my body is for my husband and so when I met my husband and you know we discussed this and you know we waited until marriage and I'm just like, me, if, you know, the person that I used to be, I can't actually relate to that person. You know, I, I look back and I, I look at who I used to be and I'm thinking, who, I can't actually relate to that person, Mark. Like I can't physically, or I can't comprehend how that person could behave the way that they did because I'm completely different. You know, I am a new creation. Yeah. The old things have passed away and all things have now become new. I don't know the old Chantel. That person died and I'm now alive in Christ. I am new. Do you know what I mean? I'm a new person with a new mind, new thoughts and new feelings. God has completely made me whole. You know, when I first got saved, I then, you know, if you remember when I said that, when I was 16, I was saying I'm going to write a book. When I first got saved, I felt that that was the time to start writing. And that took me 10 years to write because there was so much in my book, so much in my book that I don't even share when I'm sharing like, you know, events and stuff. There was so much in there that I was scared to allow it to be out there because it's a vulnerable place. But I remember someone said to me once, you know, if you don't share what God has done, how is anybody else supposed to know that they too can come through? You've got to share the raw truth. And so for 10 years, you know, I wrote that book and I pondered over it. And that was um, published on the 14th of February, 2018. And my book's called Beauty for Ashes. And it's just been so amazing because since that book has come out, the things that God has done, it's just, I cannot even, the Lord has opened doors that I would never have ever thought that I would even be in these places sharing. You know, I shared my story with BBC News um, on the radio station. And then when I'd finished, another producer came to see me and said, we'd love you to share your story again so we can put it on our website and our Facebook and all this. So, and, it, and they said it was the first Christian story that they'd ever shared. And I was like, wow. I had newspapers um, contacting me to do articles, secular newspapers to share my story. Um, it was just overwhelming just so much like doors that God had opened my story was um written in the parliamentary review which the prime minister would have read I'm just like 
God, like <laughs> little old Chantal that everyone had written off. <laughs> really, God. But what was so amazing about 2018 was um, one day I was sitting on Facebook, because you do, and I remember seeing, because I follow UCB, because I know that UCB played a huge part in my life, um, listening to the work, you know, the inspiration and all that sort of stuff. And I remember being on Facebook and seeing UCB and seeing this new thing come up and it said, there was two women and it said, these two women are UCB ambassadors and they've got amazing stories of how God has worked in their life and how UCB has been a part of it. And I remember sitting there and this is exactly what I said. I didn't pray, I didn't get on my knees and become all holy. I just said, oh, I'd love to be an ambassador for UCB. A week later, I was an ambassador for UCB. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and how that happened it was god so there was a there was a christian youth event happening the weekend and i remember one of my friends contacted me and said you should contact them and see if you can like sell your books have a stall there to sell your book and i thought oh that's a good idea so as i was going to email them i had this feeling in my heart that i don't just want to sell my books i want to share my story with the young people because i feel like i relate to them and i understand them and i, I you know, I want them to see that, you know, there's people in the church that are open and transparent. Yeah. And so I emailed the director and I said to him, hi, I've got this story. This is the BBC News um, video, if you want to see like what it's about. Um, I would really love if I could share my story with the young people at this event. And then the director called me back straight away and he said to me, wow, we were just praying to God for someone to share their story. And your email came through. Incredible. and I was like wow there's like would you love you to share your story I was like okay and so I went to the event that weekend there was thousands of young people about 2,000 young people and I remember going on stage and sharing my story and I shared about UCB and how UCB was a part of it and all that but what I was completely aware unaware of was in the audience was a UCB trustee and a UCB director and so when they heard me share my story they were like oh my gosh we need to speak to this girl. But when they came to look for me, I'd already gone home. <laughs> so they got my details from the director. And I remember getting an email a week after, you know, saying, oh, I'd love to be an ambassador for UCB. I got an email and the email says, hello, Chantal. This is blah, blah, blah from UCB. We heard that you shared your story over the weekend. and would love to speak to you about working with you with being an ambassador for UCB. Is that not God? Yeah, amazing. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my goodness, like, Lord, because that was only God. Only God had heard me say, I want to be an ambassador for UCB. You know, it was him. And so the same organization that God had used to reach me, I am now an, a part of that organization to reach others. Yeah. And so being an ambassador for UCB is where people will book me to share my story. And so 2018, the whole of 2019, I did not have a break. It was literally weekend after weekend after weekend. I was traveling all over the UK sharing my story because people were booking me, booking me, booking me to share my story with UCB. The Lord has been amazing, Mark. He just overwhelmed me. He's, he's given me more than I could ever believe that I could have. But most importantly, he's given me salvation. Yeah. He's saved my life. He saved me not only when I got st stabbed, but he saved my soul. Like, I know that if I was to die tomorrow, I would go to be with my Lord. God did that for me. He paid the price for me. And I couldn't understand why, you know, God would love me because no one had loved me before. But I know now that God loves us all. He came for every single one of us. And it doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter how far we've gone from him. It doesn't matter how much we don't know him he will pursue us con continuously and all he wants from us is that we surrender and say yes you know mark i've seen the work that you do and you are surrendered to god and you've said yes and it's just amazing just to see what you're doing for the lord and how you know even through some of the tough things that you've been through it's so inspiring for me to say because it encourages me to keep going because no matter what we have to keep going for the lord mm -hmm. You know, the enemy's always trying to take me out. Don't get me wrong. You know, he's always trying to take me out. When the Barcelona terrorist attack happened in 2017, we were there. 
24 lives. But God showed us in that time that he was with us then as well. But that's a whole nother story, a whole nother testimony. But honestly, I just want to encourage anyone that is going through stuff or maybe not going through things, but just thinking, you know, Chantal, all good for you. But what about me? And I know that I was that person, even when I first got saved, seeing things happen in people's lives and thinking, but what about me? But God has come through more than I could ever imagine. I just want to encourage everybody to always hold on to Jesus, to never, ever let go. I've been out there in the world and there's nothing out there. I've lived both sides. I've been on both sides. I know we all have, but I've really been deep in the darkness. And I can honestly say that it's just painful. It seems fun. It might seem fun, you know, the clubbing and the drinking and all that stuff, but it's temporary and it doesn't heal the void that we have. Only God can do that. The void that I always had in my heart, Mark, wasn't a dead void. It was a God void. And I can see now that God had to fill that void first before he was going to restore my relationship with my dad because God had to show me that that void was for him to fill and not my dad. And now he's restored the relationship with my dad and we're like best friends now. And so I just want to encourage everyone to never let go of Jesus. Always hold on because God will always hold on to us as long as we never let him go. So thank you. Amen. As usual, Chantel, you probably see me. I'm sitting on my handkerchief. (laughs) It's just getting to know you and getting to know you a little bit better over the past number of weeks and even stuff that you've been through, as we said at the start with your cousin Chantel. Um, You're just a mighty woman of God. And we mean that. You are a mighty woman of God. I before we finish, Chantel, there's just a couple of things. Um, where where can the folk get the book, Chantel? So Beauty for Ashes is on Amazon. Yeah. So you can get it on Amazon.co.uk. And if you just put in Chantel Leone Hales, it'll come up. Or if you just put my name into Google, it'll come up. The book will come up and things like that. Brilliant. The other thing is, Chantel, you're going to be involved in Limitless soon, aren't you? Yeah. So there's a um event on next. Saturday the 22nd um I've spoken there before I think a few years ago but it's amazing it's um I think it's a woman's event I'm not sure it might not be but it's amazing so on my Facebook I've put the link and all that sort of stuff so I would encourage anyone to just book on and just listen in because not only me but some of the women that are speaking in fact all the women that are speaking I've heard them speak before and they're so powerful and they've definitely had a impact on my life as well so to be standing alongside them you know online and sharing it's just a honor to share amongst these women so I'm really grateful that's amazing Chantel Chantel it has been so so thrilling to be with you honestly to just hear about it what age is your little baby now Chantel so my son's one and a half yeah and my daughter's almost 19 Praise the Lord. Folks, listen, you've just heard this incredible story. I'm not going to even say anything more other than this. Jesus Christ has come to give you life and that you might have life to the full. And I know this is going to reach even some people in my own family who I love, who I cherish, who think they are living a great life, but you're only existing. It's God that needs to fill that vacuum. And Chantel has shared that. So Chantel, thank you so much. Folks, just to, to keep you up to date with what's coming up in the future, it's another friend actually that Chantel introduced me to. Augustus is coming up, Chantel. God willing, very soon. It's another amazing story. We've got another lady sharing with us from the United States of America who literally drove herself into the ground in ministry to she was almost anorexic and she was like preaching, testifying, doing loads of stuff for God. But in her own words, had never really experienced who God was. And that wow. might sound strange, but she will be coming up very, very soon. So Chantel from us here in Ireland, by the way, folks, I want to say this. We're getting this lady and her family to Ireland very soon. Amen. <laughs> and so if you want to connect with us, please send Heather and I a wee message. Um, we really want Chantel to be coming here to Ireland to be refreshed, but I'll maybe speak to Chantel. She might be available maybe for a couple of nights somewhere. Sorry, Chantel, maybe. Yeah, yes. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) We really want them to come to Ireland to be refreshed. That's that's in our hearts. So listen, send us a message. Keep in touch with us. Keep sharing 
Remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's not about getting numbers or viewing figures. It's about getting the gospel and about getting real life stories out to people. So from Chantel and Mark here, bless you all. And we'll see you again. God bless.